All right. Good morning and welcome everyone to our first Focus Cities webinar of the year. My name is Garrett Fortine with UC Berkeley SafeTrek and I'm your moderator today. For those not familiar, SafeTrek stands for Safe Transportation Research and Education Center. We are a University of California Berkeley Research Center affiliated with the Institute of Transportation Studies and the School of Public Health. Our mission is to reduce transportation related injuries and fatalities through research, education, outreach, and community service. SafeTrek conducts, re conducts research, provides technical assistance and workshops to communities across California, educates the transportation safety professionals of tomorrow, and coordinates major transportation safety programs for the state of California. We are partners with California Walks for our Focus Cities efforts. California Walks is a statewide voice for pedestrian safety and healthy, walkable communities for people of all ages and abilities. They provide technical assistance to communities to create more walkable communities, and they also work at the state level to advance opportunities for active transportation. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of the California Office of Traffic Safety, who provided a grant through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for this program. We appreciate their dedicated support of community pedestrian and bicycle safety. Before we dive in, a couple of housekeeping reminders. Please be sure to mute your audio. We will be recording both the webinar audio and chat features, and we will make that recording available afterwards. If you do not want to be recorded, please refrain from talking or using the chat feature. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the chat box on your screen and we will answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions and make use of this feature. With that, I'm excited to introduce today's presenters. Jody Medeiros is the Executive Director of Walk San Francisco, which advocates for streets designed and enforced so that everyone is safe walking in our city. Walk San Francisco was the leading force in San Francisco's adoption of Vision Zero, the goal to end traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2024. Jody sits on the California Zero Death Task Force Advisory Committee and on San Francisco's Congestion Pricing Policy Advisory Committee, plus is on the board of Tenderloin Housing Clinic. Mike Jacobson is a transportation planner in the Livable Street Subdivision of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Once an intern with the agency's Curb Management Group, Mike now focuses on Vision Zero policy. He cares deeply about accessible design and creating safe spaces for vulnerable road users and populations. I'd also like to introduce those of you in the audience. There are over 100 people registered for the webinar today, and we have people from across California, from advocacy groups, city, county, and state agencies, private firms and universities, and a few folks from outside the state. That's all for our introductions. I'll hand it over to you, Jody. Thank you, Garrett. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I can't thank Garrett and UC Berkeley Safe Trek as well as California Walks enough for this opportunity and uh, welcome all of you. Um, it's so heartwarming to have so many people from across the country joining us on this call during these very uncertain times and it feels really great to have this community um, who care about safe streets and equitable streets all together and I, I look forward to sharing this hour with you. My name is Jody Medeiros and I am the Executive Director of Walk San Francisco and I look forward to presenting this project with you and my colleague at San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, Mike Jacobson. And let's uh, carry on. So I, I think it's important to begin with who is Walk San Francisco. Um, we've been a nonprofit in existence since 1989, and we are the only pedestrian advocacy organization making walking in San Francisco safe and enjoyable for everyone. We advocate and organize around the Vision Zero goal to end all severe and fatal crashes by 2024. We work with a diverse group of people, including residents, businesses, nonprofit partners, and city agencies to empower those we work with to raise their voices through coordinated action. We firmly believe that San Francisco can and should be the most pedestrian friendly city in the nation. And this is how we work. Uh, we work on policies, we mobilize, train, and educate, and host events. 
uh, in advocating for the re-engineering of our streets, ensuring that we have proper enforcement of traffic laws, and work on changing behavior that keeps us all safe. We believe that all of the road users are in this together. Walk San Francisco was instrumental in getting San Francisco to commit to Vision Zero in 2014, and we lead the Vision Zero Coalition. This is a group of about 35 neighborhood groups, community-based organizations, nonprofits, and civic groups representing communities across the city, especially those most impacted by traffic deaths, including low-income communities, communities of color, seniors, and people with disability. And through the coalition, we formed the Senior and Disability Working Group of the Vision Zero Coalition in 2016. We're also part of the city's Safe Routes to School Partnership, and we manage the San Francisco Bay Area Families for Safe Streets organization, also founded in 2016, which is made up of survivors and families whose loved ones have been killed or severely injured by preventable crashes on our streets. That is a little bit about us. And I think it's important to look at why we do this work. Because um, what we do at Walk San Francisco is critical to change the trend of the people dying or being seriously injured from traffic violence on our streets. In 2019, we had a particularly bad year in San Francisco with 18 pedestrians losing their lives in traffic crashes. And as you can see, it was one of our worst years since we started Vision Zero in 2014. And we believe that this is definitely an equity issue. Um, traffic crashes most impact our growing senior population. While they are a small portion of our current population, they make up 50% of our pedestrian fatalities. And I think it's important to note that in the next 10 years, by 2030, it's projected that seniors will make up 27% of our senior population. So we strongly feel that now is the time to design our streets to be safe for everyone from every age and every ability. So San Francisco for a long time has been putting really good policies into place. In um, the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency or the SFMTA in 2013 brought the city agencies and accessible professionals and advocates together to write this guide, the Guidelines for Accessible Building Blocks for Bicycle Facilities. And this is what San Francisco has been using since 2014 to design separated bike lanes, which we believe was a great start. But after miles upon miles of truly separated bike lanes were getting on the ground in San Francisco, we realized that more needed to be done. In San Francisco, after the death of Tu Fan, a disability rights advocate, was killed by a vehicle on Market Street, our main thoroughfare in San Francisco, the Senior and Disability Work Group of the Vision Zero Coalition was formed. This has become an important and powerful voice for safety campaigns in our city. This group has helped pass the longer walking times, We've recently done the Getting to the Curb report, and this year we are working on accessible pedestrian signals. Walk San Francisco leads the Senior Disability Working Group through a city contract, so I cannot thank the Department of Public Health enough for um, funding this work. And I do definitely want to highlight those members that are part of and an active part of this Senior Disability Working Group. This includes the Independent Living Resource Center of San Francisco, Senior and Disability Action, Age and Disability Friendly San Francisco, the San Francisco Mayor's Office on Disability, and Walk San Francisco. So how did this guide, walk, um, getting to the curb, really start? In April 27, April 2017, excuse me, we started with a tour of three current separated bike lane projects to get a perspective of those challenge for people with disabilities and seniors. This was a Senior and Disability Working Group and the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition together leading this tour. This enabled a healthy dialogue and being on the same page for advocacy and redesigning needs. While these new facilities were keeping people on bikes safe and, for, and were great for getting more people on bikes, because we think that that's really important for Vision Zero as well, they, are pro they were very much problematic for people who need direct access to the curb, mostly seniors and people with disabilities. 
The tour enabled us to document how and why the facilities weren't working and how it felt being disabled and needing to navigate these separated facilities. From this bike tour, bike lane tour, we created a notes packet that was shared with the SFMTA highlighting the challenges. And this began the steps of what became getting to the curb. In March 2018, we ended up hosting a charrette. Um, we knew that we could not do this work in a vacuum and needed to get multiple perspectives, ideas, and solutions on the table, since what we were talking about was very new. So in March 2018, we hosted a charrette, and we really opened the tent pretty far and wide. We invited city agencies from the SFMTA, May's Office on Disability, our Department of Public Works, Department on Aging, Lighthouse for the Blind, San Francisco Transit Riders, and our Bicycle Coalition, as well as adjacent city agencies and advoca advocacy groups from the Greater Bay Area. And we included local planning and design firms since they were also in community planning and part of these facilities, facility planning. We did our best to tap into as much expertise as we could. And um, we held this half day workshop and it started with just basic general introductions, some general background to get everybody on the same page, an overview of what has been done so far and um, just images and gave them, gave them up, got everybody up to speed as to the work that we've done so far, including that um, April 2017 bike tour to set the stage. At the charrette, we outlined five challenges that we were going to discuss in groups, which were transit islands, sidewalk level bike lanes, floating parking, which was for loading and unloading, floating parking, just trying to get to the curb, and five, excuse me, and other types of bike lane infrastructure. These are the things that we found on our tour to be most problematic. We broke people into groups. We had a facilitator at each group to guide the conversation. And we established group rules and prompt questions. These activities lasted only one hour. And the big poster board that you see there on our slide were at each table outlining these challenges that we are trying to explore. In addition, we each group had a worksheet to fill out and it was basic like we're showing you today. And um, what I want to emphasize is that we were really looking for solution solutions. We we're looking for solution oriented um, outcomes out of these tables. And um, after after we broke out into tables, we all came back together and presented and we were looking for those aha moments within the group. We compiled all these notes and then we really started digging into what became getting to the curb um, report. From this, in the meantime, we ended up having to create these nine principles that um, came out of the charrette. Uh, it ended up becoming before our finalized getting to the curb guide. And um, these principles are included in the guide on, on the appendix, page 23, if you have a physical guide at home. If not, I'll tell you where you can get the guide online. And it ended up being urgent that we release these principles. Um, sadly, it was because we had a very tragic bicycle uh, death in March of 2019. Um, and, and so it was really urgent that we had this call because the mayor of San Francisco was asking for more separated bike lanes in San Francisco. She gave the mandate that we were gonna build 20 miles of separated of bike lanes um, in the next couple of years. So the Senior and Disability Work Group wanted to be sure while they supported this new infrastructure and they realized the importance of it, that the city took into consideration their needs for safe access. And because we very much felt like this was an equity and inclusivity issue we were addressing with these principles. 
So there are those principles. Um, I'm going to take a look at one of the principles and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike because in his presentation, he's going to cover several others and give you a sense of how these principles have been implemented directly in San Francisco in um, a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. I do want to take a moment to say thank you to the San Francisco MTA for being open and applying these learnings to future designs in San Francisco so quickly. And here we have it, ta-da, the final printed guide, Getting to the Curb, which we released in November of 2019. So this is definitely hot off the press. It's a 30 page guide complete with illustrations, a glossary, examples of challenges we found in San Francisco with se traditional separated bikeway or cycle track designs. And I have to say that this has been a complete labor of love for Walk San Francisco and a project that we've been working on to deliver. Um, I personally have a lot of people to thank for getting us to this point. And I wanna um, thank sincerely Kathy DeLuca and Natasha Opfel, who are the leads at Walk San Francisco on this project. And of course, all of the members of the Senior and Disability Working Group who were completely essential in getting all of us to see how we need to design cities for all levels and all abilities. In addition, I wanna mention that this project would not be possible without the financial help from the San Francisco Department of Public Health, who funds our work with the Senior and Disability Working Group. This project for all of us on this call, it's meant to be visionary. It's meant to ask us all to think outside the box, yet approach a real life problem in a very concrete way. I wanna also acknowledge that every city has very different engineering practices and every street has different characteristics and need. So we created this guide to not offer strict design guidelines, but rather larger considerations and specific design features that solve some of the challenges that cycle tracks and separated bikeways pose for pedestrians. We hope you take what we've done and see where you can be applying it to your streets. <clears throat> okay, so here's a sample illustration in the guide. And I wanna um, just explain that we ended up using custom illustrations instead of photos because we didn't have photo credits for all the images we wanted to use because we didn't just use images um, that were happening in San Francisco, but we used samples of infrastructure from across the country that we had seen. And here's one of the examples that we've used in terms of a challenge crossing a cycle track. This overall goal was to solve for plentiful access to the curb. <clears throat> having to cross now a cycle track meant having to cross a lane of bike traffic. So it wasn't car traffic, but it was bike traffic. And then it was also a greater distance to get to the curb. We have here a parking protected cycle track where two individuals have exited their car into a narrow buffer and are narrowingly avoiding a cyclist passing by. There's no accessible way to reach the sidewalk once they cross the bike lane. In San Francisco, this is frequent. Blocks can be long and bike traffic very high. Here's one example of a solution to crossing a cycle track from a boarding island. A raised crosswalk from a concrete median. The median also has to be wide enough to comfortably navigate and facilitate wheelchair ramp deployment. And raised crosswalks also increase visibility of pedestrians crossing the bike lane and act as an effective speed management tool for people on bikes. One of the um, important pieces of what we created in terms of the um, getting to the curb manual is this has been one where it's only been possible because it was a big tent collaborative process with essential community engagement and time and investment. Um, it's one of these things where we wanna encourage government agencies that design our streets to prioritize early, deep, and ongoing community engagement with many of the diverse stakeholders that make up our cities. By working closely with seniors, 
people with disabilities, disability organizations to co-design and pilot content appropriate solutions, we can create inclusive streets that serve everyone. I want to encourage you to go and check out this guide. It's got downloadable on our website at walksf.org. The easiest way is to honestly find it by typing in getting to the curb from our homepage from the, um, the search button. And um, after this webinar, we'll definitely be sharing these slides and the link so you can go and grab the, um, the guide itself. So right now, I just wanna pass this on and hand over the presentation to Mike Jacobson. He's been a close partner and an ally of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. He's a transportation planner on the Livable Streets team. And Mike, it's all up to you. All right, hey everyone, um, can you hear me okay? I'll take that as a resounding, resounding yes. Yes, I can hear you okay, Mike. Um, I wanted to, interrupt very very quickly um, yes there's been a little bit of like paper noises for things and i think it might be your papers jody um so i know we're all like working at home and it's all different um so if we can keep scripts away from the microphone uh thank you all right and i and i apologize in advance if you hear uh dogs barking or any other random noises as i am also uh working from home um, but yeah, so first of all, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm Mike Jacobson with the SFMTA. I want to thank Jody um, for inviting me to co-present today and also to the Senior and Disability Work Group for being such wonderful partners uh, as the city continues to construct protected bikeways. Uh, our, in, our agency does our best work when we have engaged advocates at the table early in the process to share their lived experiences. Um, so for this presentation, I've selected a few of the many design considerations when implementing a street level protected bikeway. Um, the primary focus of this presentation is on crossing the bikeway itself. Um, there are several other very important topics we could discuss, including sidewalk level cycle tracks, um, transit boarding island design, and others, but um, we'll save those for, for another day and another presentation. Um, so before I get too deep into the slides, um, Jody mentioned some of this, but I'd like to just briefly mention, give some additional context um, on how we got here. Uh, so the SFMTA started constructing protected bike lanes to increase comfort for the city's and safety for the city's uh, growing bicycle ridership. Uh, understanding the design challenges inherent in certain bikeway designs, um, the agency worked with the Mayor's Office on Disability and other city agencies, as well as advocates, uh, to create an early accessibility, kind, accessibility guide, um, the first of its kind in the nation uh, that Jody referenced uh, earlier in the presentation. Um, last year, our city's mayor called on the agency to accelerate uh, the construction of protected bikeways um, with a goal of building 20 miles over the next two years. Um, this directive, coupled with um, our uh, relatively recent quick build policy, um, makes it even more critical that we increase our engagement with uh, disability advocates to make sure that all this new infrastructure is being designed to maximize accessibility. Um, with, this, with that context, let's, let's take a look at the major challenges that the work group identified and how the agency considers them while designing. So I, I, I looked at using the nine principles as a guide, um, I broke them down to kind of three major design challenges as it relates specifically to crossing the bikeway. Um, so the first one is how do we ensure there is equitable, safe and convenient curb and sidewalk access? Number two, how, what can we add to bikeway crossings to make them more visible for pedestrians and cyclists? Number three is how should we design a buffer that balances the need to limit vehicle encroachment into the bikeway while also providing emergency vehicle access and paratransit access while also providing room uh, for the safe movement of people with disabilities along the buffer in this constrained right of way. So let's start with, uh, with challenge one, curb and sidewalk access. Um, our first challenge is ensuring that a senior or a person with, with a disability can park, load, or unload from, from the parking lane um, and access the curb and sidewalk. 
Um, we use traffic delineators, those, those plastic posts that you see, to create a vertical separation between uh, moving vehicular traffic uh, and cyclists. Um, they have been shown to be effective barriers, uh, but through experience, we have learned um, that how and where we place them can have serious effects um, on accessibility. Do you want to go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the picture on the left is a passenger loading zone from an, from an earlier design. Uh, and as you can see, the, that vehicle is not pulling all the way into the loading area, and the pedestrian needs to squeeze through these small gaps uh, between the delineators. Um, the closely spaced delineators, um, although maneuverable for her potentially, uh, might be a much larger obstacle for a person using a mobility device. Um, and it also makes it difficult for our paratransit vehicles to have direct access to the curb. Uh, the picture on the right shows a later design. Uh, the white curb paint denotes a passenger loading zone, and you can see a uh, delineator placed at either end of this approximately 40 foot long um, passenger loading zone. Um, since this picture has been taken, we've placed one more delineator in the middle of the zone, creating 20 foot spacing between delineators, enough to allow easy movement from vehicle to curb, while also giving that visual indicator to motorists um, that they're not to pull uh, all the way into the bike lane, but only up into the, uh, that white uh, curb line. Um, so next up, uh, in terms of curb and sidewalk access, uh, how, is, how is one supposed to access a sidewalk if, the, if, they, have, if they come from a vehicle that is parked uh, in the middle of a block? Um, so during my travels around the country looking at protected bikeways, it just seems like a standard approach is to assume that the person will travel the length of the block um, to find the, along the buffer to find the nearest uh, intersection curb ramp. And we do not rely on that design. So the, the picture on the left shows what that trip would, would look like. Um, a person would, would uh, enter, would, would exit um, from the vehicle um, being parked and um, they'd be forced to make a choice. It's either travel along the, uh, the buffer to a, the nearest curb cut, which will probably not be ADA compliant, or one must travel all the way to that traffic signal in the background to find the nearest um, ADA curb ramp. Um, so the pictures on the right, the two pictures show our current approach. Um, so we use two different design techniques to provide mid-block curb access um, where there are legal parking and, uh, and loading areas. Um, the first is building an ADA compliant mid-block curb ramp at long stretches of parking or at a loading zone. Um, this is standard design for all, for all of our quick build projects. Um, our preferred design is to raise the, the crossing from a loading zone or island to the crosswalk. Um, this means that a wheelchair user doesn't have to ramp down and back up to reach the sidewalk from a, from a loading island or, or transit boarding island. Um, these race crossings are incorporated in our larger streetscape projects, um, at which, as opposed to quick builds, um, can take significantly more time to design and construct. Um, these raised crossings also add some complexity as it relates to drainage and uh, installing catch basins. So even though it requires some more engineering and design work, in terms of our streetscape projects, the raised crossing is our, uh, our preferred approach. If we go to the next slide. So um, next, let's focus on crossing the bikeway itself. Um, bicycles and scooters, you know, electric or otherwise, are relatively quiet. So we, we must make sure that uh, all road users are aware of where people will be crossing the bikeway. Um, and the first way to ensure a safe crossing is to make sure that crossing is visible. Do you want to go to the next slide? So here we're going to be looking at the next series of slides. We'll be looking at um, how to make a crossing more visible, um, kind of from, uh, from, from worst to best, let's say. Um, so picture one, you know, cl clearly deficient. Um, we don't have any co uh, contrasting green paint for the bike lane, and there's no ramp for pedestrians next to that, um, that stretch of floated parking, floating parking. Uh, picture two is a little bit better. Now we have some high contrast green paint, um, which kind of screams bike lane. Um, and there's also that, um, that mid-block ramp 
for pedestrians. Can you go to the next slide? Um, so although that second photo shows some improvement, um, picture number three, we add a, a high visibility continental crosswalk to where we expect people to, uh, to cross the bikeway to reach that curb ramp. Um, picture four adds another element. Um, so here we're looking at an accessible boarding island near a, a school and church on Valencia Street. Um, the yellow continental crosswalk across the bike lane tells the bike rider uh, they are in a school zone. Um, and here we also add yield teeth uh, and a sign to warn cyclists that people regularly cross here and they must yield to PEDS. Um, in fact, since this picture was uh, originally taken, um, we've since added a stencil in the bike lane about 20 feet before the island that reads uh, slow pedestrians crossing. Uh, and that last photo, number five in the bottom left, simply showing that we, we use additional pavement markings such as that look stencil in this case um, to advise pedestrians that they're gonna be crossing a uh, contraflow bike lane, which we have a, a, a few of in the, in the city. Can we go to the next one? Um, so our next, um, the next topic as it relates to creating safe crossings is to make sure that we can properly manage um, the speed of uh, bicyclists. So if you wanna to go to the next, next slide. So um, our first approach is to narrow the, the bike lane behind the boarding island. Um, we know pedestrians will regularly cross the bikeway to reach a boarding island. So a narrower lane will ensure slower single file riding. Um, Jody, do you mind backing up to the, uh, the slide showing the Valencia? Yeah, perfect. Uh, one, perfect, thank you very much. Um, so you'll notice in, uh, in, in picture number four that in addition to, to physically narrowing the lane, um, this is by about one foot at the island. Uh, we also striped uh, white lines to kind of also create a, a visually make, make, a, make the lane look narrower as well as being physically narrower um, as one uh, rides past a, uh, a crossing, pedestrian crossing. If you don't mind going back. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so picture two, next up we use signs. Um, we have several kinds of signs. Uh, here's one of um, making sure that uh, cyclists know that they should uh, yield to PEDS at a crossing. Um, and we use other high visibility signs where pedestrians are expected to enter the bike lane in order to reach either floating parking or to reach the sidewalk. Um, picture three shows our, our first protected intersection in the city. Um, and here we use contrasting paint, we use several pav pavement markings to influence cyclist speeds and clearly uh, demarcate where pedestrians are expected to cross. Uh, and you can see in this picture in a little bit better detail that slow pedestrian crossing de decal um, leading up to, uh, to the yield teeth and high visibility crosswalk. Um, so our last topic that I wanted to cover uh, has to do with buffer geometry, buffer design. Um, so we design our buffers to be five feet or wider where we expect there to be parking and loading. Um, that, that buffer can be wi is wider where we have um, blue zones for um, handicapped placard parking. Um, that buffer can get narrower, um, but a narrower buffer generally means that there, we don't expect or there is no adjacent loading or parking or chip generating land uses. Um, so um, if we expect, or if we have striped um, parking stalls or, um, or loading zones, we stick to five feet or wider, but it can go narrower if we don't expect people to be parking and traveling along that route. Um, on one of our, uh, the most recent field visit that we went on um, into the field with uh, the Senior and Disability Work Group, we had members um, test using a variety of mobility devices, um, testing kind of traveling along kind of our standard five foot buffer. Um, and the, the participants felt comfortable um, traveling along it to, uh, to access a nearby curb ramp. Um, and a topic that came up regularly from our advocates is that um, buffer width is important, but delineator placement can also make an otherwise wide buffer feel pretty narrow. So let's take a look on the next, uh, the next slide here. Um, 
Many of our earlier designs place delineators directly in the middle of the buffer. Um, fortunately, that picture on the left shows a relatively wide buffer, so there's still a, travel, a path of travel there, um, but just envision that same delineator placement on a five foot wide buffer. Um, this would effectively narrow that buffer down to two or three feet in width, um, which is probably not wide enough to travel in a, in a mobility device. Um, so the picture to the right shows our current approach. Um, we place delineators at either end of a parking stall, so effectively every 20 feet. And we offset those delineators um, to be positioned closer to the parking vehicle parking side of the buffer. Uh, and this, this placement serves two primary purposes. Um, first, it allows a wider path of travel along the buffer, and it also minimizes the um, vehicle encroachment into the buffer. Um, so that, that's it for me. I, I wanna thank the work group for their input and feedback um, when, as we've been deciding um, all the, what, you know, our approach to all these different multitude of design challenges. Um, so in closing, I, I, I'd um, like, again, thank Jody, um, California Walk, Safe Trek for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to continuing the collaborative work that the agency is doing with uh, Walk SF and the Senior and Pedestrian um, Disability Work Group. Uh, and I'm happy to do my best to answer any questions if they arise. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I hope that uh, everybody get a good glimpse of how San Francisco's transportation agency has taken this very seriously and into account for um, the changes of how we are designing our bikeways. Now um, we have a chance to go, we have some time, so we'll go into the questions. If you do have any questions, please type them into the, the chat box. We have already had a, a couple that I think we can we can begin with. Um, one question came, and I think Mike, this is for you. It's the question of what makes it a quick build, and was curious how much the um, the ramps are costing San Francisco. Sure. So our quick build policy um, came into fruition last year. Um, we made um, some small but uh, very effective changes to the transportation code. Um, so, so in short, a quick build project generally includes paint, posts, signs, signal changes. We're not talking about um, huge um, amounts of concrete or that you would see in a larger streetscape project. The idea is that a, a quick build um, is quicker to implement and um, be iterative. So our quick build program works in such a way that we can um, uh, cut down time on the approval process um, for these projects, um, get um, a project into the ground, and we have 24 months of um, intensive evaluation. So during the 24 month period, we have, we eval we have uh, several metrics in which we evaluate a project. Um, we judge the project's uh, successes. Um, and then after that, during and after that 24 month period, we have opportunities to refine a design, add to his design, remove a design, um, whatever the data, whatever the data um, uh, tells us. So generally paint post signals um, are, the, are the major, and signs are the major components of a, of a quick build. In terms of curb ramp costs, there is, um, a range depending on several environmental factors. Um, I've, I've heard that 10 to $15,000 is a conservative estimate, but um, they can range in price. So don't, don't hold me to that exact number for every single ramp. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here that's asking about how the disability advocates in San Francisco feel about the raised boarding islands. It sounds like advocates, disability advocates in the city of Berkeley are um, prefer street level. And from our experience in San Francisco, the disability advocates are asking for um, they seem okay with the raised boarding islands. The raised boarding islands we are uh, having at a certain 
with for comfort level. Um, after we did put the getting to the curb guide together, we did do another uh, tour of a couple of um, spots where we have made the improvements and had our disability advocates test the islands. And the, um, the raised boarding islands were also a part of the nine principles, including um, doing more in terms of temporary boarding islands. So I, I, we're not having that, we're not hearing that in San Francisco, but again, I think that this is something that each city and agency should be working with their local um, disability groups and senior groups and finding out what is gonna work best for them and make sure that um, it is an inclusive process. So uh, another question is back to the, the quick bills. So Mike, this is for you. Mm -hmm. Do the quick build areas also serve with uh, BRT? With BRT, we have raised platforms. And is this the same with your designs in San Francisco? Sure. So I, I guess the only uh, vertical element that, that can be included in a quick build design are transit boarding islands. I should have, I should have mentioned that. So um, we will include transit boarding islands um, as a part of quick build projects. In terms of, um, you know, kind of your South American or European really built out BRT stations, um, we, we haven't seen them yet at that same level in San Francisco. But in terms of um, transit boarding islands for rapid bus routes um, or for just high frequency routes on um, corridors with um, a protected bikeway, we do include transit boarding islands in our in our quick build program. Great. And we have another question. I think this is for you, Mike. It's regarding blue zones. Has San Francisco designated new accessible only blue zones to ensure that some are left available, especially when parking is um, immediately curbside, every stall is available for accessible loading, but when parking is detached and floating, only stalls with accessible paths are available for loading. So what is this, you know, can tend to reduce the supply of potential access, accessible space. So how is San Francisco managing blue zones? Sure. So we have guidelines on the number of blue zones, you know, over in a certain um, kind of geographic area. And so if we have a project that has to move blue zones we we do not remove them wholesale we might just relocate them to another area where we might have seen higher demand for accessible parking um, so I, I definitely agree that there are additional challenges parking at a blue zone and crossing a parking protected bikeway to enter or to access the sidewalk so we take one approach of including blue zones on the corners at side streets um, where, where that um, intersection curb ramp is um, easily accessible and the, the, um, the person exiting the passenger side of the vehicle can have direct access to the curb. So that, that's one um, mitigative, one, um, I guess, mitigate uh, measure we use to, to mitigate um, blue parking availability. Um, the side street placement. The other is having that, we're, if we do have a blue zone um, on a street with a parking protected bikeway, having a wider buffer, closer to the eight feet buffer, um, near, uh, coupled with a curb ramp to, to provide that access. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to create more passenger loading, which is um, all accessible, 88 accessible, while also um, still supplying um, blue zone spaces for um, people with placards that, that need to park to access a multitude of things. Great, we have a question here regarding sidewalk level bikeways. Uh, do we have any recommendations from a surface treatment or a vertical item to separate the bikeway from the sidewalk without obstructing access to the parking lane or loading zone? Yes, so um, for the uh, Better Market Street project, uh, we had an, an expert come in to do some, uh, some testing with um, folks with um, either completely blind or low vision 
community to test um, several um, types of surfaces to delineate the bike space and the pedestrian space on a sidewalk level bikeway. So that is something that we are definitely cognizant of and making to make sure that that edge between those two spaces is is detectable for, for all users. So um, we don't have many examples right now in the city, um, but once the Better Market Street project um, gets into uh, construction, we'll, we'll, we'll see um, those surfaces. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at our list of questions. If you do have additional questions, please do chat uh, and type them in the chat box. Um, Jody, there are a few questions a little further up um, that haven't been answered. Okay, uh, let me get back to the top. Yeah, and I could I could read them out as well. Um, one question that got got asked a little earlier in the presentation. Um, was sort of a general question, what would make a city go to equitable design, um, specifically like the role of perhaps liability in that um, decision? Um, I don't know about the liability answer, but the uh, answer that I would give as, a, as an advocate is while we are creating um, safe places for people on bikes, we should also be cognizant and, and attuned to the um, experience of those people with all kinds of abilities and San Francisco I think is a, a city that wants to make sure that we are um, we're making our streets safe for all and especially as seniors and people with disabilities are those that are being impacted the most by traffic violence um, we definitely want to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to make our streets that are safe and equitable for for all ages and all abilities mike do you know anything about liability well uh, not not about liability specifically um i don't want to give out any bad uh any bad legal advice here but um i, I can say generally that san francisco aims to kind of treat um uh, the Americans with Disability Act is kind of like the floor of how we make decisions and we we strive to exceed um, what's called for um, in that legislation and I think that this has been a decades long process and I think that we need to um, uh, really put advocates front and center on that I think the Bay Area has um, an excellent history of um, advocacy, advocacy from um, seniors and people with disabilities, which I think then has motivated and influenced how, um, how city government works and makes decisions. So I think in terms of what would make a city go to an equitable design, I think it's um, strong advocacy and, and partnerships with the city and also um, city agencies putting out policy documents, putting out um, kind of vision statements that really put equity and accessibility front and center. Fantastic, all right. Um, we have another question here uh, about sort of proactive and reactive. Uh, are planners considering adding in bike racks or bike parking to the bike lane planning? Uh, the silent approach seems to be a disconnect to the, to the user asking this question. Uh, the lane planning is proactive, the rack placement is reactive. Uh, and then also sort of this idea that like lack of bike parking and scooter parking could be a pedestrian safety hazard, especially at handicapped um, ramps or access points. So I, in terms of um, uh, bike lanes and, and bike parking, um, so yes, for, so bike lanes, we, we try to be as proactive as possible using um, community input to kind of guide those decisions. For bike parking, I agree that, that traditionally we have um, kind of taken a little bit more of a reactive approach where we um, will we'll, we'll get 311 requests for racks or businesses or, or individuals will, will request racks and we'll, we'll install them. Um, that's changing. I think we are, I, I don't have the exact details on how the program will work, but we are um, in, in the process of being more proactive on where we place on-street bike corrals or um, sidewalk bike racks. So yeah, the goal is definitely to, to be more holistic and more 
proactive in um, deciding where racks are and what kind of racks we install. All right, fantastic. Uh, there was another question earlier about um, sort of the experience with schools and how this might interact with schools, um, drop off and pick up time. Um, I'll sort of add to the question, perhaps you know, like buses or just um, uh, like the needs of young people in schools in general. How does that interact with uh, getting to the curb? Mike, do you want to take sure. that one too? Sure, I, I can. I can. Um, yeah, I can. I can. I can take that. I. I, I think that the the what I what I really appreciate about getting to the curb and early on in the document, um, we talk of well they they talk about um, universal design um, and the importance of universal design. So so children you know, children that are, might be, might not use a mobility device. They're clearly not elderly. Um, the benefits from those school boarding islands that um, are enumerated in the, uh, when they get into the curb report, they also benefit those school populations. So, so we've, we've had a concerted effort to add, to continue to add um, those school boarding islands where we have parking protected bikeways. Uh, I recommend um, keeping your eye out for later this year when we release our next Safe Streets uh, evaluation program, um, evaluation guide. Um, we're gonna include um, data that we've collected as it relates to um, uh, school boarding islands and, um, and the interaction of different modes and, um, and demographics. So I, I, I recommend uh, keeping an eye out for that. All right, fantastic, thank you. Um, there was another question earlier that th they asked it uh, in a way that sort of applied to Berkeley, but I'm sort of gonna turn it around a little bit. Um, and it asks about, or it proposed, or it sort of mentions uh, the possibility that residents might oppose changes to parking and curb space usage. Um, so maybe, maybe trying to reframe that in a positive way. Um, and this could be for you, Jody. Uh, uh, as well, what are some of the ways that um, you've worked to like educate residents and help um, residents sort of understand uh, what's happening uh, out front on their doorstep? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So not only do um, do we as Walk SF uh, go out and talk to senior groups regarding Vision Zero and show them all the the um, needed designs that we are advocating for to make our streets and sidewalks safer. But um, we do get members and the community involved um, when it comes to any kind of streetscape project where we are going to be doing any kind of re-engineering. And part of that involvement is a lot of the educational piece and explaining the, the why we're really doing this work. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of my, of my presentation, um, Pedestrians are the ones that are most impacted by traffic violence. Uh, last year alone, we had 18 fatalities, um, one person on a bike. And this is why we really do the work that we do. And any kind of education that we can do to the general public um, is, is important. I also want to, you know, put a plug in for all of this and what we're doing in San Francisco and what we're doing across um, all city, you know, cities across the U.S. If, with our Vision Zero work is this does take political will. Um, not everybody is going to like uh, what we call daylighting and removing um, those parking spaces from the curb because it does reduce parking in cities where parking is um, hard to come by. But the fact that our city is doing this through our quick build project um, and removing those parking spaces and prioritizing people that to us is the most important and that does take political will. So not only, not only are we busy educating the general public, but it is also the advocacy necessary to get um, our political leaders on board. Thank you. Uh, Mike, did you have anything to add to that? I think Jody had a, that, that's mm -hmm. a great answer. Um, I guess from the, from the agency side, um, you know, we, we have guiding 
principles such as our transit first policy. Um, but we also are all, we, we want to be um, uh, attuned to um, the, the, the needs and uh, opinions in the communities that we work in. So I think it's important to have advocates kind of at that grassroots level, um, kind of um, cheerleading good projects that they support along the way and influencing the conversation. Um, ultimately, we are uh, responsible for, for making sure that streets are safe. And that's our number one goal. Um, so we need to balance many opinions, many personalities, many ideas, but ultimately we have guiding principles um, and the, the uh, principle among them is, uh, is safety for all road users. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we've, we've answered most of the questions here um, and we're almost done. So I'll sort of close things up. Um, we're at the end of our session together. Uh, I want to thank all of our presenters. Uh, thank you, Jody and Mike, for your time on this and for sharing your knowledge and experience with all of us. Uh, I encourage everyone to take what you've learned today and apply it to your work. Uh, as a reminder, we will have these slides as well as a link to the recording of the webinar available for you soon, along with the contact information for our speakers. Uh, finally, we will host two more Focus Cities webinars this year. We hope that you will be able to join us for those webinars as well, and we will reach out with more details. Thanks so much for all of your questions. Thanks so much for sharing uh, part of your day with us. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>